I decided, hmm, I know I should make another stand. Not for a second did not any, like all of us wanted him. We all wanted him, no matter what. We just wanted him safe, happy, healthy, and loved. Wilson asked Dakota if he was ready to get up, and are you faking? My daughter walked by while that, that little boy was laying on the ground dying. Every child deserves to feel safe and comfortable in their home environment, which should provide them with a level of familiarity and a sense of peace. Every parent should strive to provide their child with the safest, most loving home possible. But when a child is ripped away from their loving home time and time again, that child learns to be on edge. They begin to realize that the second they are finally comfortable and content, all of that will be taken away from them. And when they start to act out, their behavior should be addressed with a sense of compassion and understanding, not violence and control. Unfortunately, for 10-year-old Levi, that isn't what happened in today's case. The details of what happened to this precious little boy are sure to shock and devastate you. With that being said, let's just jump right into it. Dakota Levi Stevens, who is called Levi by his biological family, was born October 21st, 2013 in Munster, Indiana, and he was the big brother to Nora Faye. Levi was described as having marched to the beat of his own drum. He loved the outdoors, catching frogs and insects while on his little bug hunting expeditions. He also loved aquatic animals, especially sharks. He fully believed that he would one day discover a whole new species of shark. He loved being unique and using his imagination, with those around him saying that he always made up the most creative stories and ideas, often acting them out. He loved to sing and dance in his own quirky way at any given moment, always being a source of happiness and entertainment for those around him. He loved all sorts of music, but his favorite artists were Katy Perry and Bruno Mars. He loved anything where he could build, such as Minecraft and Legos. He also loved playing Pokemon. He was known as being artistic, always drawing and coloring. Levi was very intelligent, especially in math, which was a subject he loved. Even at a young age, he was very well-spoken and wise beyond his years. He would always complete his homework and get good grades. However, when it came to school itself, he gave his teachers and staff a run for their money. He had his own strong opinions and was a master at bargaining with everyone, especially his teachers. Despite his troubles at school, though, he had one favorite teacher, Miss Tarnowski, who stood by his side and acted as a huge inspiration for Levi. Speaking of inspiration, Levi was such a role model to his little sister, Nora. Levi absolutely adored his little sister, with family saying that their happiest moments were when they were together. Even though Levi went through some really difficult things in his life, he always remained positive and optimistic. He truly had a huge heart and could put a smile on just about anyone's face. Now, for the first five years of Levi's life, he grew up in a home being raised by his biological parents. However, by 2018, both he and then three-year-old Nora were removed from their care after them being deemed unable to care for their children due to struggles with drug addiction. At first, both the kids were placed with their aunt Anna. But after about a year with both kids under her care, in May of 2019, the Department of Child and Family Services removed them from her care. Now, while with Anna, Levi and Nora were attending therapy sessions twice a week. Well, according to Anna, she reported to DCS that Levi was having some behavioral issues at school. In response, DCS recommended that she increase the number of therapy sessions each week to address his problems. However, Anna didn't necessarily think this was a good idea. They were already going to therapy twice a week, they had two scheduled visits per week with their biological parents, and they had school. They already had such packed schedules and had no time to just be kids. But pretty much immediately after making this recommendation, a judge ordered that Levi and Nora both be removed from her care. According to her, she didn't really get much explanation for that decision at all. She also never got a chance to even speak with the judge about the whole issue of increasing therapy and why she felt it wasn't a good idea. They were just removed from her care so quickly without much explanation at all, and there wasn't anything she could do about it. After being removed from their aunt's care, both Levi and Nora were sent to separate foster homes. Pretty quickly, Nora was actually adopted by her foster parents and remained with them, I believe, to this day. 
Meanwhile, Levi didn't have it quite as simple. When he was separated from his sister, who again was his best friend, he was devastated. Then, for the five years that followed, he moved through various foster homes, never really having any stability in his life. While that was happening, various family members were trying to work with the state of Indiana to gain back custody of him. Anna tried to get it back, but when she was rejected, other family members such as his grandparents, Anna's own parents, other aunts of Levi's all tried to work with the state to get him back, but they were always rejected. They even worked with lawyers to try and prove that they could provide a safe, stable home for Levi. They literally did everything they possibly could to try and get him out of the system, but nothing worked. The state continued to insist that they have custody of this little boy rather than allowing him to live with family members who cared so much about him. So he continued being ushered from home to home never having a true stability in his short life. Of course, with this life of constant change and never being anywhere long enough to get comfortable, Levi struggled. He struggled to adapt with his ever-changing environment and he always yearned to be back with his parents. By 2021, his biological father actually died from a blood infection related to his drug abuse problems. It was also around this time that his biological mother relinquished her parental rights, so she was no longer trying to get back custody of Levi or Nora. So this was just yet another hit to Levi that he just had to take and deal with. So much trauma for such a young boy. According to Levi's grandfather, George Stevens, when Levi first entered the system, he had a really, really hard time dealing with it. He said that Levi is a very stubborn boy who could throw a tantrum if something went wrong. But at the same time, George knew that Levi could flourish if he was given the proper support. He even had seen it with one of the first foster homes he went to. Hayden Hetzel was his foster dad from 2019 to 2021, and he said that Levi was such a unique, funny boy who really bonded with them as parents. He called Hayden dad and loved going on adventures with him, being outside and collecting bugs. <laughs> Ten-year-old Dakota Levi Stevens was like yeah. most kids. I stand and I decided, hmm, I know I should make another stand. He enjoyed playing with blocks to fuel his imagination baby dog, baby dog. and busting dance moves to burn some energy off. But he mostly loved being outdoors. Dakota, so what color do you think your eyes are? Brown. Dakota, he was very adventurous. He always loved being outside, looking for bugs in the backyard. Hayden Hetzel considers himself lucky to have shared wonderful years with Dakota. He was his foster dad from 2019 to 2021. He never didn't call me dad. Like, you know, he was always like, dad this, dad that, let's go on a walk. <laughs> and we just want the system to be better. Hetzel says in Dakota's short life, he moved from one foster home to another. He wanted to give the young boy a permanent roof over his head. He even went as far as tattooing Dakota's initials on his ankle, but says attempts to adopt him were unsuccessful. He was always loved and not for a second did not in like all of us wanted him. We all wanted him, no matter what. We just wanted him safe, happy, healthy, and loved. Can you X that one off in the garbage? I know on phones you can do that. Yes. In fact, while under their care, the family did try to adopt him two different times. The first time, Levi's biological family protested and wouldn't allow it to go through. But ultimately, everyone in the family agreed to let him be adopted. Everybody just wanted what was best for Levi. So Hayden started the process for a second time, waiting for everything to go through and be finalized. At the time, Levi was enrolled at school as a third grader. He was also ordered to continue his therapy and he was able to see therapists that he had previously seen when he was younger. So that did provide him a small sense of familiarity. However, one random night, Hayden said that he got a text from a DCS worker informing him that a Lake County magistrate had issued an order to have him removed from their home. He was then removed immediately after. To this day, once again, Hayden said that he has no idea why this happened. There was little to no explanation given. He knew that the judge said he preferred that Levi be adopted back into his biological family and didn't want him to be adopted by anyone who wasn't related to him, no matter how good of care they could give. That is what Hayden sort of gathered from the ruling, but still, he isn't totally sure why this was decided to this day. 
So again, immediately after making that ruling, Levi was removed from their care. Because of the fact that this family wanted to adopt him and the judge wanted biological family to adopt him instead, yet his biological aunts, uncles, and grandparents were also being denied custody. Then, after removing him from a home who loved him, he was placed in yet another home with, you guessed it, a non-biological family, another foster home. The fact that these decisions were being made with little to no explanation just makes things that much more frustrating, and the explanations we do get are simply nonsensical. I'm sure that somehow the system thought that they were doing what was best for Levi at the time, but him being removed from those homes would ultimately result in Levi's tragic demise. If he had just been left alone with the foster parents who loved him and wanted to adopt him, maybe he would still be alive today. But because of some random, unexplained decisions by people who will never admit to their role in this, a little 10-year-old boy is dead. After leaving the care of Hayden's family, Levi was placed into a new home. We don't have too many details on what was going on within that family or really anything about how Levi was adapting until Thursday, April 25th, 2024. By around 3.31 p.m. that day, police were dispatched to a home located in Liberty Township, Indiana in response to a medical emergency. Turns out, something had happened to then 10-year-old little Levi. He was found in the yard of his foster home, not breathing, before EMS workers arrived and got him breathing again. He was first taken to Northwest Health Porter Hospital before being airlifted to South Bend Memorial Hospital to monitor his status. There, he was placed on life support for two days, where staff monitored his brain activity. However, by Saturday, April 27th, he was removed from life support and he passed away. This whole situation is just so messed up and really frustrating from the very beginning. First, neither Levi's biological family members nor his past foster parents were notified of him even going to the hospital until after he had died. So they couldn't visit him, couldn't say goodbye, nothing. Then when it came to a sudden death, no one knew what had happened to him. No one knew why he died or whether he was killed or if it was an accident or something else. Then, because Levi was a ward of the state, neither families had any say in whether he was taken off life support. That decision was made by the state. For months, this is all of the information the families or the public knew. We knew that 10-year-old little Levi was moved from home to home despite having family members beg to have custody of him. We know that he was removed from his foster home who loved him, all because they couldn't get the adoption to go through. Then, years later, we hear that he has died. That's all police were releasing at first. However, months after this tragic, tragic death, we finally now know exactly what happened to little Levi. And let me tell you, what really happened is so far beyond what anybody could have guessed. So, sometime after being removed from the home of Hayden Hetzel, Levi was placed into the care of Jennifer Lee Wilson. Now, I'm not sure if it was immediately after or if there were any other homes in between, but this was the family that he was placed with and Jennifer and her husband were, I think, able to adopt him. That's not 100% confirmed, but there were some sources that say that they were able to adopt him, which again, no idea why they were able to and nobody else was, but that's beyond the point. Jennifer had three other children in her home, all who were adopted. By the time Levi joined the family, she and her husband had actually planned to stop fostering and relinquish their license. Their three adopted children were getting older and they wanted to travel. But they decided to take in Levi anyways because they had provided respite care for him two years prior. For those of you who don't know, respite care is basically when a worker will come in and care for a child temporarily and give some relief to the child's full-time caretaker. Having children with disabilities and behavioral issues can become incredibly overwhelming, so respite care workers will give those parents an opportunity to get a break and relieve them of their duties for a bit so they can recollect themselves and get some things done that they've been needing to get done, such as grocery shopping, maybe they go get a haircut, or just take some time to themselves. It's a really great service for parents who do care for children with disabilities. I recommend respite care to so many families that I work with in my healthcare job working with kids with disabilities because again, being a parent to children with a lot of needs 
is very overwhelming at times. So again, because of this past connection with Levi, Jennifer and her husband decided to take him in. According to Jennifer, Levi had verbal and physical aggression issues, which they had been dealing with for quite some time. Now, the story I'm about to tell you of what allegedly led up to what happened to Levi is directly from statements made by Jennifer when she spoke with first responders. So just keep that in mind as I tell you these details. On the morning of April 25th, Levi apparently woke up feeling agitated, so he just was not behaving well. At some point during the afternoon, Jennifer told the kids that they could go outside and play after they finished their chores. Levi was refusing to do his chores, so Jennifer told him that he couldn't go outside. To this, apparently Levi told Jennifer that he was running away and walked out the door. Jennifer could tell that Levi was upset, so she gave him five or so minutes to cool down because she had never seen him this upset before. He had never threatened to run off like that. Jennifer checked the backyard, assuming he was there, but he wasn't. So she hopped in the car and started driving around the neighborhood looking for him before spotting him down the street talking to another woman. Jennifer pulled up, demanding that Levi get in the car, but he refused. The woman told Jennifer that Levi just told her that Levi was asking her to call the police because Jennifer was hitting and smacking him in the face. Jennifer told the woman that she didn't know what she was talking about and she needed to mind her own damn business. I added the damn for dramatic effect. Eventually, Levi did get back in the car with Jennifer, who then drove him back home. Once home, though, he refused to get out of the car. Jennifer went around the back door and opened it, at which point Levi started screaming, telling Jennifer that he was leaving and never coming back. He then got out of the car and tried leaving, but Jennifer ended up getting him to the ground and laid on top of him. Jennifer said that when she tried to stop him from leaving, she can't remember if she tackled him or if he just fell to the ground when she grabbed him. Either way, her intention with lying on him was to hold him and stop him from leaving. I want to use now as a time to note that 50-year-old Jennifer was 340 pounds. This is not a video to shame her based on her weight or shame anybody else who weighs the same. I'm pointing it out because being that she's so heavy, she obviously is going to put a ton of pressure on a 10-year-old little boy who reportedly only weighed around 90 pounds. According to a quick Google search, her sitting on Levi is the equivalent to LeBron James plus another grown woman adult sitting on him. It's the equivalent to Shaquille O'Neal sitting on that 10-year-old little boy while holding a 20-pound weight, just to put it into perspective. Jennifer told first responders that as she was holding Levi down, she had one hand holding her phone and the other hand holding her up on the ground. Jennifer got a hold of the caseworker via video chat who tried de-escalating the situation. She was then able to speak with her husband via the ring doorbell camera, telling him that Levi was having one of his days. As he was trapped under Jennifer's weight, he was screaming and calling out for help before he just stopped fighting. At that point, when he stopped responding, Jennifer said that she got up, rolled him over, and said, are you faking? But when she realized that his face and eyelids looked pale, she started freaking out, beginning CPR, and calling 911. In total, she told first responders that she only sat on Levi for about five minutes, and as soon as he stopped screaming, that is when she got up, and that is when she realized that something had happened. Of course, this entire thing was a total accident. She never meant for this to happen. She just wanted to stop him from getting away and wanted to de-escalate the situation. She didn't mean for any of this to happen. Now, after hearing this story from Jennifer, officers went over to the neighbor that I mentioned, who was the woman that Levi I had run over to that afternoon. According to her, this was about 30 minutes before emergency workers arrived, so just minutes before his death. The neighbor told police that Levi asked her if she could adopt him because his parents hit him in the face and wouldn't let him call his caseworkers. According to the neighbor, she didn't notice any visible injuries on him at the time, so she wasn't really sure what to make of the situation, which, just to pause, is really sad to me. Knowing that Levi was tossed around from family to family, he probably thought that he could just run up to this woman and she could just take him in and away from his current family and just live with her forever because she seemed nice enough, but obviously, 
that just isn't how it works. Now, like I mentioned, Jennifer's home did have a ring doorbell camera, so of course, police took a look at that footage to see if they could corroborate Jennifer's story. There are a total of five videos captured on that camera. The first video starts with Jennifer already lying across Levi near his head and neck area. That video is about 20 seconds long and Levi can be heard screaming the entire time. In the second video, it shows Jennifer still on top of Levi who is screaming and crying with her phone in her left hand and her right arm and elbow planted on the ground beside him. Then a third video now shows Jennifer still on top of him near his buttocks and low back area. At that point, his arms are above his head and he is no longer moving. That video is 6 minutes and 48 seconds long, and the entire time he is no longer moving or making a sound while she continues lying on him. The fourth video shows much of the same, Levi lying in the same position, not moving, not making a sound. Then in the fifth and final video, it shows Levi lying face down on the ground, arms above his head, completely still. Jennifer, who finally got off of him, is facing towards him while kneeling on the ground. She is frantic and screaming Dakota several times. I'm guessing that obviously this family started calling him by his first name despite his birth family calling him Levi. After calling out his names several times with no response, she screamed to one of her kids to call 911 before shouting, I was laying on him because he was acting bad. So obviously already this story does not line up with what she was telling first responders. She was lying on him, it seems for about 10 minutes. And for more than half of that time, Levi was no longer moving, no longer breathing, and no longer making any sound. After that, as we know, first responders arrived, finding an unresponsive 10-year-old little boy who wasn't breathing. He was found to have bruising all over his neck and chest area. At the time, they described Jennifer as visibly distraught. They were able to get him breathing again before rushing him to the hospital, at which point he was placed on life support. Two days later, he was pronounced dead. After his death, he was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. There, it was found that his cause of death was due to mechanical asphyxia and his manner of death was found to be homicide. By May 6th, almost two weeks after little Levi's death, his funeral was held. At first, it was said that his biological family wouldn't be allowed to attend, which to me is just disturbing. Again, I understand that he was a ward of the state, but saying that his own family couldn't attend is just outrageous. The family took to social media and found numerous supporters who blew up that DCS office, and ultimately, they were allowed to attend. At the funeral, mourners shared all the memories they had of Levi. He was a kid who truly had the kindest heart, even through all of the trauma he experienced. He taught his family how to be compassionate, how to view the world in a better light. He did not deserve this, and everyone who loved him, everyone who tried so hard to care for him, they are all just devastated and heartbroken. After Levi's death, Jennifer obviously had her foster parenting license revoked. Then, finally, months after Levi's tragic, painful death in July of this year, Jennifer Lee Wilson was arrested and charged with reckless homicide. It was after her arrest warrant was issued when the public finally found out about these heartbreaking details for how Levi died. Home security videos show Porter County deputies on approach to make an arrest neighbors have been anticipating for nearly three months. It's sad um, for what she did and how long it's taken. Deputies had planned to take into custody the foster mother of 10-year-old Dakota Levi Stevens. <laughs> he died in April under circumstances that weren't clear at the time. But prosecutors now say his foster mother, Jennifer Wilson, killed him when she lay on top of him in their yard for more than eight minutes, cutting off the oxygen to his brain. You know, my daughter seen it happen. My daughter walked by while that, that little boy was laying on the ground dying. Um, so we were hoping for some justice today and it didn't happen.
Court records show Wilson told deputies during an interview that Dakota was acting out. He'd run away to a neighbor's house, accusing his foster parents of hitting him, and he refused to get out of the car when Wilson brought him home. She restrained him on the ground with her body. In those records, a description of what happened over the course of five doorbell videos that captured the incident. The first two, deputies say, show Dakota screaming underneath Wilson's weight, her body positioned near his head and neck. In the next three videos, he doesn't move. The documents say Wilson asked Dakota if he was ready to get up and are you faking? Realizing something was wrong, she asked one of her other children to call 911 and can be heard saying, I was laying on him and he was acting bad. Yeah, he had his behaviors and we did have to put him in some holds, but it wasn't like we weren't sitting on him. We weren't physically like on top of him. Dakota's former foster father says he was taught how to safely calm the little boy. And then just hold him like a bear hug. And then literally when we do that, he just he would he would be upset for a minute and then he'd like melt in your arms and that's what he needed at the time. Dakota's extended family says they'd almost given up hope they'd see accountability. I felt grateful that due diligence had been done and that justice will be served. But at the end of the day, the, the t it doesn't bring happiness because he's still gone. At this point, those are all of the details that have been released about his death. Because of how recent it is, we don't yet know at Jennifer's plea or if there will be a trial. Of course, as with any case with loose ends like this, I will keep you updated as soon as I find out any more information. Now, in the aftermath of Levi's devastating death, of course, police have come out in droves to talk about just how badly he was failed by DCS. Unfortunately, Levi's is just one of many cases that involve the failures of not just DCS as a whole, but specifically Indiana's DCS. We discussed another horrific case from Indiana that happened around the same time in April, where a five-year-old little girl, Kinsley Welty, was locked in her closet and starved to death by her mother, all the while other family members were fighting for custody. Time and time again, these judges are just making the worst possible decisions for the kids and it just does not make any sense and they are not held accountable at all. With Kinsley's case, DCS refused to remove her from her mother's care despite reports of neglect and abuse. With Levi's case, he was promptly removed from his parents and biological aunt and placed into the system, refusing to let his family or his first foster family have him back. And the reasoning? Oh, you can adopt him because we want him to be with biological family. Yet, they also wouldn't let him be with his biological family. So instead, they took him away and sent him to yet another home, preventing him from ever finding that stability that a child so desperately needs to thrive. Somehow, Jennifer was able to adopt him despite telling his biological family members and other foster parents no. And look what happened as a result. It's just failure after failure from DCS, whose only job is to protect children. It's so infuriating to hear these cases over and over and over again with nothing changing. And when things like this do happen, DCS barely says anything. With Levi's case, all they said was that their foster parents have to go through training and licensing. That's basically it. They're basically just trying to cover their asses by saying, well, it's not our fault that we removed Levi from several homes, all who loved him and treated him well. It's Jennifer's fault because even though she was licensed, somehow Levi died under her care. It's always just sorry excuses and nothing is ever actually done to prevent this from happening or improve this problem as a whole. Now, after hearing these details, I do wonder what you guys are gonna say about how Levi died and how Jennifer was charged. I know some of you will think that she should have been charged with first degree murder, others will say second, and I would say that I do agree. I think that at first, she may have tackled him and sat on him out of frustration, not necessarily meaning to kill him. I think she did want to hurt him, but I don't think she meant to kill him at first. But in the midst of it, I do think something clicked in her mind and she made the conscious decision to keep her weight on him, knowing he would suffocate because again, she started on his neck area. Why would you lay on someone's neck area unless you want to restrict their breathing? And with that, when there is time to either make a decision or stop yourself from making a decision that can be counted as first degree murder because that is premeditation even if it's only minutes before it happens. Then if you do want to argue that it's second degree murder because it did happen in the heat of the moment, that can also be made as an argument. 
Why do I think this again? Because there were over six minutes where Levi was no longer moving, where Jennifer continued lying on him. She knew that he was no longer screaming. She knew that he was no longer moving. And I guarantee you, she felt him stop breathing. Yet she stayed there. Then I think after realizing what she had done and the fact that she will be held accountable, that is why she freaked out. But that is just my opinion. And without actually being able to read Jennifer's mind, there's no way to improve intent definitively. It could easily be argued that she didn't know he died while sitting on him and didn't mean for it to happen. That is why ultimately I do agree with the charge of reckless homicide. Her actions were reckless and directly led to his death. She knew that she could cause his death, especially seeing how she, again, laid across his neck and chest. I clearly think she was trying to restrict his breathing, and I think that will be provable in a court of law, but I don't think they could actually get the charges of first or second degree murder to actually stick, so they probably went with the charges that will be easiest to actually get a conviction for. So I'm so curious to know if more will come out about what was going on behind the scenes within that home. Was there abuse? If so, was it against all of the children or just Levi? Again, we know that these parents didn't even want to be foster parents anymore, but took Levi in anyways. We know that he had behavioral problems because of how he was brought up in the system. It's totally possible that they just regretted their decision to take him in and took it out by abusing him. Levi said himself that his foster mom was hitting him, and I do believe him. But at the end of the day, we do still need proof, and I'm so curious if we are going to get it. But that is what I think, and now I want to know what you all think. Do you think Jennifer killed Levi on purpose, or do you think it was an accident? What do you think of her choosing to sit on him in the first place? What do you think of DCS's role in all of this? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time.